to the Santa Cruz Alliance and uh, delighted that you could make it today for the fourth in our in our Meet the Authors series. We have, excuse me, back, or sorry, Christina. Uh, we have Christina and Bob who are going to be um, telling us about their fascinating walk as writers. And um, one of the purposes of this series is to introduce writers to other writers and uh, familiarize them with the walk, what's behind it, but the public as well, to understand. You may have a book in front of you, and here's the book, but what's behind that book? How many years went into the writing of it? Uh, how much time did that author commit to that book? Um, what training went into it? What accidental training? Um, people have been talking about experiences they had, um, so we, we have a, a pediatrician here, Dr. Bob Reese, who was, was talking about his experiences that led to the writing of fiction. So what's behind our writing? And one of the purposes of this series is to explain exactly where these, where these books are coming from. So we're really delighted to have two very talented uh, writers with us. Um, let me introduce uh, Bob Aubin. Uh, who was uh, born and raised in Providence. And Bob says where the roots of his words and stories were formed. So that would be interesting to hear a little bit more about that, right? Uh, what exactly, how exactly did that environment <laughs> the that he was writing about? He studied at uh, LaSalle Academy and Providence College and always had an underlying interest in the tales of his Canadian ancestors. So here are clues to where Bob's writing comes from, uh, from his interest in his, in his background and his academic background. Um, he's lived in Massachusetts, has raised a family, and I love this, Bob uh, wrote, and struggled with the lure of the word. So writers, do we know what that means? Yeah, we do. We, do. we all know it's, it's sort of an addiction. It's, you know, it's a crazy pastime, but we do it, right? Um, so uh, Bob is going to be talking about his, his uh, book, let's see, uh, The Clam Trees of Rock Harbor, and is it Lucat? Lucat. Lucat. Okay, so Bob? Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Joanne uh, Westhouse for all the work and efforts that she's uh, gone through for the Alliance here, and all her uh, volunteers and Christy for putting together the uh, literary component of this. I uh, uh, was at a symposium a few years ago and was enlightened with the fact that uh, most fiction writers are, are women, 80% or so. Mm -hmm. And um, men have a, a dwindling percentage, I guess something less than, than 20. Um, writers as well as reading, I mean, people just don't read as much. I say people, I mean men, okay, women uh, readers. You can go into anyone's house and pick up uh, uh, Jody Paco or uh, Annie Crow mm -hmm. or uh, Elizabeth Bird. You can see her out, so it's very, very obvious who's reading today. Um, the, uh, I'd like to share some of my thoughts about writing from, uh, uh, from my own perspective, of course. And uh, I'm not, I'd like to talk about, first, two things I'd like to mention are the voice of, of the writer and, and the tempo. As, as a reader, I mean, I would like the, the words to jump off the page and, and, and hear them rather than reading them. So the voice that, that, that the writer has is a very important ingredient. And the tempo that he can sustain uh, through that writing. So from my perspective, two important components that, that I look at or think of is the voice and second thing is the tempo to be able to, to maintain it. Not getting into the elements of character or, or dialogue or anything like that. I want to kind of focus on those two things in terms of what's important to me. I, uh, 
and mention that how long have I been writing? 20 years. I really started writing about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, when we first moved to the Cape, I had some time and I started putting some thoughts <coughs> together about the uh, Holocaust. And that's what we caught is, is a story about, uh, about that. A lot of little personal anecdotes and stuff like that. Um, and uh, how did I get there? Uh, the, I've been always thinking about writing since I went back to, to school. Uh, I was involved in the literary journal at, at school with poetry and, and sh short efforts. And uh, when I was 22, I just mentioned to Christy, I wrote my first novel, you know, novella, and uh, submitted it to uh, Dell Magazine, Dell uh, Publication, and uh, uh, within three or four months received a nice pink three by five <laughs> yeah. uh, So I don't know where that novel is today. But, but, but that was my beginning. And, but that was 60 years ago. And uh, so I've done a lot of thinking about writing, active thinking. I spent too much time thinking and dreaming and piecing, piecing words and thoughts together that are going to end up someplace, sometime. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how or where. Uh, the uh, probably the most important thing from my perspective is that the writer has to have a story to tell. Um, I can't just want to be a writer. I have to have a story to tell, and the success of that is uh, dependent upon my ability or my skills uh, to, uh, to do it well, to develop it. And that comes through the development of craft. So I don't think too many people just are born a perfect writer. So um, the story <coughs> needs to have a basis. And I write fiction. It just seemed to be a natural um, a place for me to go, a natural thing. Uh, to do, and that's what I've done since the beginning. But it's still true. There's truth involved, there's fiction involved, there's facts involved, there's incidences and legends, and it's a mixture of, uh, uh, of so many, many things. And we dress it up. We dress up the story with uh, turmoil and struggle and uh, resolution. So whatever the basis was, uh, I was pushed in some uh, in some manner to to write to express this thing that I had within me, and uh, I didn't only did it do it for me. I wanted to do it for the reader. Okay, and I can read you some of my rejections that I received from from. Uh, uh, publishers years ago, and sometimes publishers are very uh, honest and very helpful, okay, because uh, in my particular case, I was too instructive and, and too detailed, and, and uh, I can go to that later <coughs> some time. Where do these stories come from? Where did um, Lukat come from? Where did the, the train come from? Uh, Vichy to Paris, so uh, 250 miles, a four-hour trip to Drancy, which is uh, within the uh, 11th uh, uh, district of Paris. And then the train from Paris, from Drancy to Auschwitz, is uh, 929 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can run anywhere between uh, uh, 900 miles, it would take them um, sometimes three or four days. It should have been able to be done in one or two days, but there was a war going on and there was a lot of other people using those rails. So sometimes these, the Jews that were on that train waited for uh, uh, three or four days to get from Drancy, uh, which was like a holding station in Paris in, in that arrondissement in Paris to Auschwitz. 
So, um, uh, um, let me move to where the stories come from. We've got uh, uh, plant trees, uh, divine providence. They all kind of have a sequence. And um, I might have been just finishing Lukat and I was walking in the harbor up in Orleans and I saw those clam trees out there and that was the genesis of, of, of that book. Okay? But um, where, where do the stories come from? Well, they come from my work history uh, and the people that I've met in my life through work and, and personally. And um, I've always been immersed in the healthcare field, my family, uh, being physicians to physicians, we've had nurses, uh, clinical um, uh, people. Uh, 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 Kathy and I both have been in the healthcare field our whole life, 40 years, and since some time less than that for Kathy. And I, I just kind of want to uh, remind you too that Kathy did have a life before mine. <laughs> and, 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 and I want to let you know because you know I thanked uh, Christy and I thanked Joanne. But Kathy worked for a publishing house in California when she was a kid, when she was young, not a kid. And she also helped her brother run a small newspaper out in uh, uh, the Flathead Valley in Montana. So I didn't get a lot of help along the way. <laughs> Inspiration. But, but uh, for my for the, the the work history, I go back to the time I was uh, in my early twenties, uh, and I've always been involved with either um, uh, um, uh, medical surgical houses. Sometimes uh, the first one uh, had a wet and dry line. They m manufactured lotions and salves and things like that were used in <coughs> homes and in hospitals. And when I was first introduced to the company. I went in and the owner took me on a tour and we went into the back room where they had a, he called it a laboratory. And there was a fellow back there, a big fellow, and his name was Lenny. And he was using like a small canoe paddle in a tub, mixing this uh, septi germ, is what the name of it was. And then he walked over to this wall of little wooden boxes and he <coughs> pulled out uh, a little piece of paper that had the secret formula <laughs> of the septi girl. And he was so proud of that. And Lenny kind of reminded me of a character out of, of Mice and Men, just a big quiet guy, and uh, with the tub there, and I, I never forgot him. And he was so proud that, that he held the formula. Okay? And I'll tell you this anecdote because it's important as it enters into Lucat down, down the road. But uh, I stayed with that company for four or five years and then moved on to a, a, a clinical laboratory supply company, petri dish, pipettes, things of that, that nature. And then I moved to, to Boston. And when I came to Boston, uh, so the workplaces have a relationship in terms of where the stories come from and who you meet in their stories. And when I came to Boston, I met a fellow named Sam along the company, and he and his partner came up from New York. The big uh, houses in Boston at the time was E.F. Mahady and Surgeons and Physicians Supply Company, and these two Jewish fellows came up from New York to start their own company, and they wanted me to help them out on the sales end. So I came in, and they were only in business for two years, and uh, the fellow that I met, Sam, uh, uh, became my uh, uh, kind of a mentor to me and uh, uh, told me the story about, he said, oh, he said, you're French, he said, do you know anything about <coughs> Vichy France? Well, the only thing I knew about was to ask it ignorant of Vichy, except what I knew in school, it was a provincial government in, um, in the um, uh, southern sector of, uh, of France during the uh, Second World War. And, uh, well, he gave me an education. He brought me a book, and it was a history book on the Second World War, but it had a section in there about Bishop France that you couldn't find any other place. And so he wanted me to become educated about this so that I would remember. We must remember what happened there with six million Jews 
what happened between Vichy France and the death of, of 70,000 Jews that, that the Vichy regime was directly responsible for. So he wanted me to remember. And um, from that, I moved to, from, from meeting Sam, and Sam's not the only one that's had an effect on my reading life. I've met uh, a lot of people, and it stays in this little storage <laughs> component of, of my computer. And yeah. some, some days, uh, hopefully, it'll all keep coming back when I need it. Um, but Lukat uh, is a little village uh, right near uh, Vichy. Uh, and it's where this band of um, um, a family called the um, uh, Sigmund family uh, ended up after um, 200, 100 years of traveling from Romania uh, to uh, Ukraine, <coughs> to Belarus, uh, they weren't welcomed any place, to um, uh, Lithuania. And finally, at the time, uh, France was receptive to bringing Jews in, and uh, the caravan moved down there because it was a big supply resource for Vichy France, which was a, uh, it was like a Cannon Ranch or like a Meribou, which where wealthy people went to go to the warm natural springs and get the beautiful curative ointments. So uh, uh, they moved the caravan down and uh, to uh, a small village next to the Alier River, and uh, that is where the Sigmund family lived with their apothecary, made all their creams and ointments, and they would bring them in into Vichy and sell them to the salons. So it was. It was great. The only thing, it was the wrong time. It was uh, 1940, 1942, 1944. And the man who controlled nine of the salons in Vichy would buy all of this stuff because the septiderm, uh, they had a different name for it then, uh, was such a, a great curative that everyone in the salon business in Vichy mm -hmm. was using it on all their guests, on all their <coughs> patients for psoriasis or, or rosacea or bed sores or, or anything, it was the best curative. And uh, what happened, the fellow who controlled these salons was in cahoots with the uh, commissariat, the head of the Vichy regime, in, which was in Vichy, and what they were doing, uh, they were responsible for collecting Jews and sending them up to the uh, Nazi sector, the occupied sector, and, which was in Paris, and then to uh, Auschwitz. And um, the commissariat and the head of the salons uh, contrived to go into the village and uh, turn over all the Jews, put them on the train to Drancy, and collect all their goods and whatever was stored there and take it and hide it in uh, Geneva because he had the, the commissariat had the um, uh, selections, the, uh, 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 the, the uh, connections in Vichy to make this uh, possible. So what Sigmund, uh, there was one person who survived this and his name was David Sigmund. Mm -hmm. And David Sigmund of course is of the right age after he escapes, he's the only one to escape from uh, Birkenau, uh, from Auschwitz, mm -hmm. and uh, it finally ends up in America ends up in America, and uh, this thing is on his mind constantly, and he starts searching out where there would be a salon in New York or Providence, or, and finds someone by, the, by that name, okay? So Sigmund, and he goes knocking on the door, okay? So he is a Roma, he was a ghost of Sam, okay? Because Sam wanted me to remember, but Sigmund, knocked on the door. He was the ghost that reminds us in the book that in a way we all are called uh, uh, to remember, okay? So I, I could talk about this quite a bit longer and I'm never gonna get to the clam trees. So this is a very good place for me to cut, all right? So thank you very much for, for your time, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, our next uh, the speaker is going to be uh, Christina Northrup. Um, 
much to say about this particular writer. Nordstrom. Nordstrom. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Sorry. Thank you for the correction. Um, uh, Christina said uh, that a veteran uh, journalist friend and mentor once said, writing uh, is just thinking. And she says that the Park Street Angels, a chronicle of hope, um, yeah, this, this marvelous book, um, is that. It is writing, she says, what I saw and heard, what I thought and realized as I commuted from the suburbs to Boston to work every day and encountered a, a homeless stranger. Um, Chris, Christina's uh, uh, book was a winner of the Weathered, uh, Feathered, sorry, I'm having troubles this morning, uh, Feathered Quill Book Reviews 2017 Debut Author Bronze Award. So congratulations on that. Um, and this summary says of the book, in the summer of 2006, Christina Nordstrom met Bob Wright, who sat on a milk crate on the sidewalk outside Park Street Church in Boston. Walking to work one morning, rather than avoiding eye contact, she overcame her fear, crossed the street, and greeted him. She learned how to constructively help him and facilitate his progress from Park Street to a permanent home. The story charts their evolving friendship as formerly homeless Bob adjusted to his, his new home. Um, so Christina has a background in, uh, 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 in grant writing as a public health education pub, uh, program director and is also a singer-songwriter. So the versatility of writers is, is always so impressive. And, uh, Hopefully, uh, you'll mention a little bit about the, the singer-songwriting. If you were at uh, Porch Fest a few weeks ago, Christina was at, at one of those uh, venues. But this is a fascinating uh, uh, journey that you've walked, and we we'll look forward to hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I do like to thank the Alliance uh, as well for, for hosting this. And just the affirming this, it's, it's so affirming to be this is my first book. I, I, as you mentioned, I've, I've done a lot of grant writing and that kind of thing in my, in my work history. But, um, but actually publishing a, a book, uh, putting it out there in the community is kind of frightening sometimes. <laughs> it's it very um, difficult. Um, it can be difficult. But, it, but again, this has been a very affirming uh, experience for me. So thank you. Um, so my book, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, so the purpose in it is to kind of give a face, uh, put a face on elder homelessness. Um, I've learned so much um, through this whole uh, process, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. And, um, but also I want to share a solution to, um, which is the Hearth um, Incorporated, which is the former uh, Boston Committee to End Elder Homelessness. Um, is an organization that um, focuses directly on services for um, elder seniors. Um, they, they don't focus on the whole homeless population in Boston, but they, um, and, and they are really making an amazing um, contribution um, to that community. And just number-wise, they're, they're, according to Hart, there are 2,500 seniors over the age of 50 in Boston, and um, excuse me, in Massachusetts, and then 100, uh, 1,500 in Boston alone. Um, they serve about um, over 500 elders, and it's it's through um, outreach. They help them, if they're not housed, they at least help them find services um, within the community, um, help them um, with, you know, finding food pantries and some shelters and things like that. Um, and they, they now have um, seven residences that provide um, eight, 188 units of permanent supportive housing. And it's, it's the whole being supported housing. It's one thing to give a formerly homeless person a place to live, but if, if they're not familiar with budgeting and you know, if there is any income or whatever, uh, looking at resources and, and how, how do I live, um, it's, it's, a supported, um, it's supported through staff and volunteers. Um, they're also breaking ground this year for a new site that's going to um, 
at uh, 50 or some odd more units. Um, yeah, and I know a volunteer there, and um, through this whole process I've become a, I wanted to share the story, and that's, that's kind of what I'm using um, this book to do. So um, just um, a little bit of my background. Um, I was um, gainfully employed since 1969 as I started out as a secretary. I had to leave. I was taking a medical secretarial course at um, Colby Junior College in New Hampshire, and I had to leave um, after a year because um, the financial um, constraints in my family. So I was the one that could be elected to go out and go find, go find work. So anyway. <laughs> And I did, I did um, work as a secretary um, in a very large insurance company in Boston, um, in the public relations department, and to this day I will not watch an episode of Mad Men. <laughs> but um, I consider myself a lifelong learner, um, and at the age of 40 I uh, graduated from UMass Boston's College of uh, Public and Community Service, which is where I learned to write, actually. Um, I went there part time while I was working, and then I, then later um, at the age of 52, um, I graduated from UMass's Graduate College of Education, and most of my um, career was spent in uh, uh, public health education program management. Um, as I, um, I was working at in 2003. I was working at um, Jordan Hospital, which is now BID Plymouth Hospital, um, as the community um, health education director. Uh, coordinating all of the, the programs, smoking cessation, first aid, um, stress, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, well, we had a whole uh, department there, but in um, in that, at the same time, after after several years of, of that, um, the um, the budget, you know, whole healthcare budget financial crisis um, made the hospital need to to, to you know, they just got rid of the program <laughs> and they. Um, Sort of farmed out to um, independent consultants to provide. You know, somebody else would come in and provide CPR training, or whatever. So I was working um, part time. Um, they had an AIDS, uh, a HIV AIDS treatment program, and I, um, I wrote the grant for that, um, and uh, was kind of managing the grant. Um, and, but I was only working up to about ten hours a week, and I, I thought a couple of other little consulting things, but. Um, it, it just wasn't making ends meet, and I was kind of afraid. <laughs> the ends were afraid when it did not at all. Um, so I was on, on partial employment as well. Um, some friends and family re and I referred to it as patchwork time, but I was kind of uh, putting things in a patchwork, trying to make make life work. Um, I was a single mom. I had a uh, teenage son, and uh, so. Anyway, so I, and there was one point where I was not working, it was six months time where I, you know, all of consulting work went away and um, anyway, but I still kept looking for a job. But in, in uh, 2006, I, um, I landed a job at the Department of Public Health in Boston, um, um, directing the obesity prevention uh, program for the state, it's a CDC funded program. So. Um, that's my story had a happy ending, <laughs> and, but I but I wouldn't forget the patchwork time. Um, so that's kind of a setup, kind of to where this is. I'd like to read some if, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, so I need to say also I took the T the red line to um, I was living in um, Pembroke, uh, Norwell, and I lived in, in Pembroke. Um, at the time, uh, but I was commuting, taking the Braintree um, tea, uh, the tea from Braintree, the red line. So one day, uh, in new route to work, I noticed a man sitting in front of the Park Street Church. I passed him there every day for a few days, noticing him out of the corner of my eye to avoid being engaged. He had white gray hair, a beard, and glasses, which made him look kind of like a Dickensian Saint Nicholas. <laughs> but he was dressed in a t-shirt, jeans, and a baseball cap like any contemporary of mine. Okay, an old hippie. <laughs> From a short distance, I could read one of the handwritten signs that sat next to him on the sidewalk. It demanded, smile, it's the law. <laughs> I obeyed the law, but kept walking. <clears throat> After a few days of this, he caught me peeking, and our eyes connected. I was afraid, I don't know why, because he was smiling, but it's probably just because I got caught. 
I glanced away quickly and kept on walking. Then I looked back over my shoulder and saw him still watching me through the wrought iron railing of the church steps, ice blue and smiling, his eyes connected with mine again. But I kept walking. There was something about his eyes that stayed with me all that day. Then I wondered if he, they were trying to tell me something. And then I felt somewhat foolish. I imagined he might be some kind of an angel, the kind that only some people could see, or one who's dressed like any man who crosses your path and has some kind of message or challenge for you. Anyway, I didn't stop because stop, I didn't have any change handy, and I didn't want to take the time to take off my backpack and fish around for some change. I kept walking. Tomorrow I would be better prepared. So the next morning at 7 a.m., I sat back on, in the black vinyl upholstered bench on the train. I fished around in my purse inside my backpack and found a few quarters. I put my premeditated donation in my pocket and hoped that I would make good my intention. I hoped that I wouldn't get cold feet and walk by if I saw the fellow again, my park student. It's not as if you could just walk by and flip a few quarters into his paper cup and keep walking. He was situated so that you had to intentionally walk over a few yards to, to get to him. He didn't jingle coins aggressively in paper cups like other folks on the street did. He had an old cigar box that sat in front of him on the sidewalk. A cane leaned on the church wall behind him. He never asked outright, can you spare any change? He always just smiled and waved at first, especially the children on their way to take <laughs> away. I made, my, I made good my intention. After crossing Park Street, I walked over to him and handed him the quarters. He took them while gently, briefly, holding onto my fingertips. Then he let them go. Maybe it was a way of his requiring a connection. With a warm smile, he said, thank you, ma'am. I was a little nervous and muttered something like, you're welcome, and I'll take care. But what kind of care could be purchased for 75 cents? I was rather embarrassed, and during that <coughs> transaction, I saw another sign next to him that said, Homeless by Fire. That, too, stayed with me the whole day. Well, this was the beginning of an unintended, unconventional friendship. I would look forward to emerging from the subway each day on my way to work and speak with him about the events that shaped his life. I found myself investing in him as a neighbor. Um, And what I would also like to do is to uh, recite a song that I wrote after having met him, I, um, after three months of, of this, getting, kind of getting to know him. Um, I would sing it, but I can't do that today. <laughs> <laughs> getting over some laryngitis. But this is called Angel with an Attitude. <laughs> <laughs> For he did have an attitude. <laughs> Well, he wasn't there this morning. Guess he had something else to do. I was kind of looking forward to hear his point of view. He'd tell his joke, he'd make me smile. He'd make me laugh, he went the extra mile. And the sign that sat there next to him said, it's the law, smile. The first time that I met him, I quickly walked on by. The next day I encountered him, he looked me in the eye. I turned away, afraid to see, then went along my way. Then I looked back as I walked on. His eyes had so much to say. They were tired and full of aging, but the message still came through, as if he were some angel disguised to look like me or you. Maybe it's some paradox, and in reality, like so many other angels, they're invisible unless you want to see. Next day when I saw him, I finally came prepared. Some quarters that I set aside, left over from my fare, were waiting in my pocket, hoping there he'd be took a lot of gumption. This was something new for me. He sat outside the church at Park Street, right near the Park Street team. He'd set up shop like he did all most days, but of concern to see, another sign placed next to him said, homeless by fire. I handed him the quarters. He said, thank you, ma'am, and smiled. So I smiled and muttered something and then walked on my way. And as I went about my work, I thought of him all day. What's it like to be out there? And soberly I mused, could I really walk in his shoes? He could be a character from Steinbeck, living in some hard luck tale. 
but he also looked like Saint Nick with his white beard and long hair. But how dare I romanticize his grim reality? I pay a price when I discount his full humanity. The next day that I saw him, with two dollars more to spare, I said, I'm sorry for your trouble. And as I lingered there, it occurred to me to ask him about his work in former times. He said he was a coppersmith way back in his time. He worked on roofs and steeples, I'm sure a master of his trade. He said that of his people, he was the only one remaining. Illness now had taken hold, and he had the sugar blues. Then he relented, now this is all I can do. I asked him where he stayed at night. I didn't mean to cry. He didn't mind my asking and said he stayed in the subway. Do they give you any trouble? He said, oh no, not me. It's all about my attitude. They let me be. Then I asked him where he get his care. He felt that I could helpful be. Said he found some friendly doctors over at Mass G. <laughs> they gave him drugs and insulin, shot up four times a day. Living on his attitude, he didn't have to pay. He told me that he could stay healthy if he could only get some food. When living in the streets like this, it was hard to test his blood. But table scraps from garbage cans sustained him every day. I wondered if he had the faith to pray. For what it was worth, I told him I could somehow empathize. I'd been out of work for half a year. But lest I trivialize his present situation, it might have been mine. When there was doubt, my hard times would ever end. With the help of some gracious friends, there for the grace of God was I. You might ask what's in, it, what's in it for you. Or you might ask me how I know that he isn't trying to con me to buy smokes and alcohol. The answer is very simple, but a paradox, you see. It's kind of like forgiveness. I'm doing this for me. <laughs> Maybe I'll see him tomorrow. I wonder what he'll have to say. Will he smile and tell the same old joke, or will he find another way to live and keep on seeking his winter heart's desire? Perhaps that's as an angel there, beneath the Park Street spot. And so, as we, uh, there were three of us who um, became, two, were, two of us were friends and we, we met another friend, a fellow named uh, Jonathan Margolis, um, a friend of mine from home. Uh, she was retired and she didn't go into Boston, um, but she kind of met Bob, his name was Bob Wright, he called himself Homeless Bob, Homeless by Fire. Um, and he got to know Bob Wright, she got to know Bob Wright through my relating what I had, um, how I, what, what I did today. Um, and then Jonathan Margolis, who was a, a lawyer, he did the same thing that I did. He, he kind of met Bob as, on his way to work, too. But every day, most, most days, um, we would, uh, Jonathan Margolis and I would meet with Bob on the corner. Um, we'd just talk with him for 10 minutes and, you know, find out what, what's happening. And then um, if there were things that he needed, um, Jonathan would help him um, with boots or an overcoat, um, and Sue and I, um, we shared giving him a, a stop and shop gift card. Every week one of us would take a turn doing that. Um, so we, we, just, we just all kind of became friends and really got invested in his life. Mm -hmm. um, we learned about, uh, we learned about uh, hearth, oh, before I say that, um, one of the ways Sue got to know Bob was through, I, I would write daily emails, I'd get to work, you know, early for work or something after work, I'd, I'd send them an email, this is what happened today, Bob did this, we talked about this, <coughs> this happened on the corner, and this is what he needs, and you know, that, just that kind of thing. And, and the way I would write the emails, um, I, would, I would, you know, I'd like to paint pictures, uh, paint word pictures, <laughs> and so she, at one point she was saying, like, I can see it, I can see it. And she said, you want to write a book? So, okay, so that's, well, maybe, <laughs> I don't know about that. Anyway, these, um, you know, I, didn't, I had never done that before, so and what would I have to say anyway? Um, anyway, so just getting to know Jonathan, uh, Jonathan and Bob and, and Sue, we all kind of um, worked together. This, this fellow was um, disabled, and um, 
he was, winter was coming and we really knew that um, he couldn't stay out on the street. We had lost him back and forth. He had to come out sometimes. He was a, we found him in a hospital um, several times. He had um, advanced um, diabetes and complications from diabetes and, and so forth. And um, he, he was very proud that he was, he hadn't lost any of his toes. He said most homeless lose their toes and especially from diabetics I know can too. Uh, but he was, he was very proud that he has not lost his toes. Um, the things we take for granted, right? Um, so anyway, we learned about um, this organization called Hearth, um, and uh, Jonathan um, did a lot of the heavy lifting, and he helped him fill out the application, and it went and took him to Hearth for an interview and so forth. And, um, he had gotten, um, he was, in, Bob was in the hospital, and got got the word that he was accepted and so Jonathan moved him from the hospital to Hearth, which is which was a wonderful thing for him. And we we um we kept our friendship with him. We didn't just say, okay, you're housed, bye. And but we, we kept a, a friendship with him. Uh, we visited him at Hearth. He would also go back out to the corner because he would he had made friends with so many so many people um, on their way to work in the same way that Jonathan and I had, mm -hmm. had met him. And um, there, there were, it was outside the church and, and there were kids that went to daycare. And they, they had met him too. He, he's, a, um, he's a very likable kind of a guy. Um, and so, so he was housing again, but we, we um, um, helped him do that and kept visiting him. Um, I just want to read another little. So this is December 5th, um, 20, uh, 2007. At precisely 5 o'clock, the carol on in the newly refurbished steeple of the Park Street Church rang out with O Come All You Faithful. On a colder than usual day in early December, snow had been falling since mid-afternoon. It created a sense of magic and anticipation in the evening air as it sparkled to the ground, like Peter Pan's Tinkerbell, sprinkling fairy dust on the parade of weary holiday shoppers and evening commuters. Now on my way home, my footsteps were slow and deliberate as I navigated the icy brick sidewalk outside the church. I glanced over at the spot from the corner where Bob sits, and I remembered our conversation over the last few weeks. You know, Bob shared recently, I wake up at night now and I'm in a bed with clean sheets and it's warm. I still can't get used to it. But my laundry is done and they wash my dishes too. He's been having trouble calling it home and he hopes that they don't kick him out. Um, he would always, when we went to visit him um, at his apartment there in the assist in, um, Hart's assisted living um, unit, um, he would always sit at his door uh, with his um, Face, facing the door um, because he was so afraid of somebody coming up and stealing something from him. He always he needed to be in control. He couldn't sit his back to the door. So, and my, my book has so my book is, is a journal of our time between. Um, 2006 when I met him and, and when he was housed at, um, at Hearth. Uh, but then, and so my first, my first um, iteration of the book ended there, but then since then, um, we, the story kept going. <laughs> um, so I'll just read a little bit. So while this is where my journal ended, the story continued. Finding housing for Bob was not to be the end. Sue and Jonathan, my son and I, continued to visit him in his new digs, sometimes for holidays, sometimes for no particular reason. During our visits, Ruggles' staff would come in, bringing his medicine and check to see if he needed anything. They would also wash any dishes he had and take care of his cleaning and laundry, too. In spite of this new, secure living arrangement, he never felt totally safe and made a point of always sitting on the side of his bed or in a chair facing the door. So that he wouldn't have to watch out for anyone coming up behind him. Good morning, Mr. Wright, said Sarah, one of the nurses as she knocked in and entered the room during one of our visits. I'm dropping off your meds for today. I'll leave them on the counter. Bob responded, Morning, Sarah. Thanks. Sarah continued, 
Oh, and, they have the, and the band will be there to pick you up for your appointment in about 30 minutes. Is there anything you need before I go? No, thank you kindly, Bob said. Got everything I need. Um, so he... So as we, as we got to know him, he, um, his health still um, um, declined. And um, he was, he, but he was at least there for uh, close to two years. Um, he had a uh, kidney uh, failure, and um, he he did pass away. And um, we, one of the things that he talked about was being invisible, sitting out on that corner. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to not make his his passing invisible as well. So we, Jonathan and I. Um, worked with the Park Street Church to see if we could have a, uh, a memorial service. And we weren't sure, you know, and they agreed, and we weren't sure if there could be any, anybody would come. We, it, we didn't know if it would just be John, Jonathan and myself. Um, there was, it, it filled the, the, the visitor center there. Mm -hmm. um, he had made so many friends over the years, we put mm -hmm. up a sign on the Park Street, on the corner where he sat outside the church to say that there would be a remembrance for him then. Mm -hmm. And, um, also, he was buried in the, um, the, the cemetery for the poor in Hyde Park. Um, and they're not allowed to have a, a marker for where they're buried um, so that they remain invisible. We, we, we just didn't, we couldn't abide with that. Mm -hmm. So, um, coincidentally or not, there was a woman at my church who had donated a, we have a memorial garden, and she had donated a, a stone for anyone who needed it. She was no longer in the area, so we got that stone for, for Bob. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, I have pictures too, and I can share them with you later mm -hmm. on, but, um, so, um, it, that is all to say that we, we didn't, that we remembered him. And the story um, honors his life, um, and the story <coughs> kept continuing as um, he told us that we had never, he had never, none of his family was alive and he had just, had nobody. And then several years later I found, uh, or I got an email from a stepsister who had, I, it's a whole other story on how she found that he had, he had passed and um, she had lost touch with her, her stepbrother and his, and his little brother too who had passed. Um, after 20 years, they had they didn't know where um, he was, but she found through my my book. She was a promotion of my book, um, so she she sent me an email, and um, we we touched base. And since then, I was able to um, learn more about his life and um, send her some of the, the things that um, he left. Some of his writings. He, he kept a, a, a journal himself. Um, he, all, he had a ten, um, ten top, um, a birthday wish list of the ten top birthday wishes, and, and the last one was always um, hope and not despair. That was it's number one on his top ten list of birthday wishes. So I, there was a whole lot of stuff that he had shared uh, with us and um, left to us. Um, I had a whole stack of his journals and put together some of those thoughts to him and sent them to his sister. So. It, 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 there's, I wish I could tell you the whole story, but it just, it just keeps on going. By the book. That's right. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. How about some questions? Anybody? I have one question, and that is, uh, his, your description of him, <laughs> makes him seem to be a very warm and wonderful person, and you wonder why he was so alone in the first place. He, he was um, abused as a child. Mm -hmm. um, he and his brother, his mother deserted them, and um, he, had a, he had a stepmother. His father remarried, and she didn't want them, so he's, he and his brother spent most of their growing up in foster homes, they were, and they, he said I was in the home for little wanderers and spent mm -hmm. most of my time running away from the home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got into trouble, made some, you know, not, not so good um, 
decisions and stuff. And I guess one of the things that I've I didn't say, but one of the things that I, I highlight in my book is the whole notion of adverse childhood experiences and how they impact our adult lives, um, uh, mentally and physical, uh, mental, mental and physical health. Um, with with, um, with homeless seniors, they age like 15 to 20 years sooner um, than, than we would. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of it in, in you hear so much about this um, early childhood um, adverse experiences, and so that's another thing that I, I wanted to bring in the book. So, but yeah, it was, it was kind of like. Can I ask Bob a question? Um, if, if Place Kabukat is that um, fiction or non-fiction? Fiction. It's fiction, and so you don't use any of the real names. No. no. Well, I you know. I had to use Drancy because Drancy yes. exists, yeah. but Lukat does not exist. Um, oh, I see. Oh, no. Well, I'm, they, they may be some little villages here and there, but uh, I tried uh, the best. Like, it, it wasn't a primary uh, a site in France. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. mm -hmm. And I needed a place along the river, mm -hmm. which is right, it goes right near the Abishi. So <laughs> I actually got the name. <laughs> From a French cafe down on Fifth Avenue. Anybody else? Well, thank you. A few, a few comments before we, we close. Um, if you've wondered why writers write, you've heard to preserve history and to preserve to preserve memories. This is a a core piece of, of why we have undertaken our new projects. And, and thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think, too, we can think about the courage that it takes to be a writer. Uh, Christine is talking about, if you've thought about this yourself, the first time. This is her first time writing a book. And Bob shifted gears to, uh, to do this, too. So. It's to step out into that space that's unfamiliar. Are you going to meet with success, with failure, with what? With not acceptance? What's you know what's going to come of this? So we can hear this morning. Thank you both so much. Um, what it takes. What's what is behind this? <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.